So today we are going to talk again about static type checking. Yesterday we've seen that in Groovy 2 we introduced type checking, which is optional. <coughs> but we also saw that there were limitations to type checking. Limitations because the language, the Groovy language, is a dynamic language. You can have scripts. You can extend, for example, the script class just to have default variables in, in your scripts or use the binding to have variables in your scripts. And Groovy is a platform of, ch of choice for type checking, for, sorry, for DSLs. And a lot of people use Groovy as a DSL development platform more than just a language because it's really easy to have a DSL which runs without having to deal with a custom parser for example okay so here we will see that in Groovy 2.1 so the just brand new version of Groovy you have tools that will allow you to plug into the type checker and add your custom type checking rules or I would say you can do more than just type checking you can add custom checks and you can somehow have Groovy used as a tool to have static code analysis directly into the compilation system so because the, the rest of the talk is really technical, I'm going to skip this part really fast. So this is just what we saw yesterday. But basically, what's the problem with type checking DSLs? The problem is that a DSL is specific, so it's focused, readable. This is really important to know that a DSL is meant to be readable by humans. Machines, we don't care about machines, we can have passes. Okay, readable, embeddable. And just let me know how many people use or think they use Groovy as a platform for DSLs in that room. Okay, how many of you use Gradle? Okay, so you use DSLs. How many people use SQL queries? Everybody use SQL. SQL is an example of a DSL which is really focused and we could want to have type checking on SQL. Why not? The problem with type checking DSLs is that the implementation of DSL is very different from one project to another. You have many choices in Groovy to implement your DSL. You can use runtime metaprogramming, compile time metaprogramming. You can have Groovy shell, running shell, uh, scripts. You can extend the script. You can do really a lot of things to implement your DSL. And the type checker is really not aware about the implementation of your script. Another point is why it's a really important question, because this, this talk is about that. Why would you want to type check DSLs? Anyone has an idea why you would want to do that? Okay, so you don't know why you're in this session, in fact. Okay. <laughs> I can give you a hint. In the past, I was working for another company, and we were using Groovy as a platform for DSL. The problem is that the users of the DSL were not programmers. They were people who used computers as tools. And we gave them a DSL, they wrote DSL. They were indeed writing code, but they didn't know they were using code. And you can't really ask those people to write unit tests. They will look at you like this. Unit what? 
they don't know what a unit test is. And you don't want to have that code in production with something that can break in production. You want it to fail earlier. So the idea behind DSL type checking is to fail early for DSLs too. We can fail early with static type checking for programmer code. This is comfort zone. You want to fail early at compile time. And for users of DSLs, you want to fail early to protect yourself from having bad code in production. Okay? So this is an example of a DSL. Please show me the code. In Groovy, this is equivalent to having this construct. And now I want to type check this. So I can do this like that. I can write my DSL like that. I'm using, for example, get code to use the dot code probably notation. I'm returning an instance of DSL. I have an enome. Okay. And if I run my DSL, it works. The question behind this is, is this a good way to implement a DSL? I don't think so. You don't want to implement your DSL in a way that allows the type checker to type check it. It's a bit bizarre to do that. Okay? You don't have to be forced to use an implementation just because you want it to pass type checking. It's just not the way to do that. So, type checking should not drive your implementation. You should not have to use custom wrappers to your scripts, for example, to be able to allow type checking. By wrappers, I mean you can have scripts that just modify the DSL at runtime before it is compiled, for example. You, you know, something that would add some lines in your code or change some tokens. The problem with that is that when you have a user error, the line numbers, for example, don't correspond to what you have in the code, so you wouldn't be able to debug your code. And last and important thing is that it should be easy. It's not as easy as I would like it to be, Yet, it's easier now to do that, because just before it was an impossible task. <coughs> so the first option we have to allow type checking in the DSL is to use delegates too. Builders, for example, the markup builder in Groovy, everyone uses a builder in Groovy at some point. A builder is some kind of DSL. You have new markup builder and you use HTML, P, div, etc. And this is a DSL. If you try to type check that using Groovy 2.0, it will fail because the behavior of the, the builder is a runtime behavior. So methods like HTML doesn't exist at compile time. With delegates too, you could implement a statically checked builder. It doesn't mean that markup builder is statically checked now, it is not. Yet you could have a sp specific version of the markup builder for HTML that only supports some kind of tags, which is statically typed. <coughs> And actually, this is interesting because I don't know who did that, but in the past days, I've just seen that someone tried the type checker extensions exactly with that, using the delegates to annotation. And it works. You can have a static statically typed builder and statically compiled builder. So it works just as a reminder, by annotating your code, 
So here we have the foo method which doesn't exist. Well, it is not known at compile time because here we have an object which is of type foo, but the type checker doesn't know that we delegate to foo, okay? And now just by adding delegates to foo, the compiler knows that this method is called unfoo. It's okay? This is the easy part. In that case, I'm just using delegates too, but I don't specify a type here. I'm specifying a parameter. And the type here is object. Yet, here, it still passes compilation. Anyone knows why this works? It's a bit difficult. <laughs> flow typing. In Groovy type checking, we have flow typing, which means that at, that, at this point, the compiler knows that in opt we have a foo, and when it finds this method call, it will check delegates to, find the target, and say, okay, so you call in with a foo. And I can know that foo exists on the foo method. So this passes static compilation. Awesome. Another example, which is some kind of real-life DSL that you can find. We have a robot on Mars. And the DSL is robot.move100. It's very easy, probably not what they use currently to move the robot on Mars. A bit too much verbose. Yet, if you try to compile this script, the compiler doesn't know about robots. So, move doesn't exist. And you're doomed. Okay, and imagine this is a much bigger script with somewhere in the code robot without the first O in millions of lines of code. This goes to production and once after 15 minutes, I think, to go to Mars, the message to be sent to Mars, you have the problem, you have the feedback that the command failed at runtime. So it would be good to be able to find this at compile time. We can. So I'm saying that work in progress, actually since yesterday it's not true. You have this available in Groovy 2.1, but we will probably improve the API as you find some problems, some maybe some verbosity that you don't want to have. <coughs> if you want new methods, we will be able in the future to add new helper methods to the DSL. Because the idea now that I will explain to you is that using a DSL in Groovy, we have a type checking DSL that allows you to type check DSLs. But this DSL is not type checked itself. So if someone wants to roll, <laughs> You can try it. <laughs> so this is how it looks like. You define a script which will be executed at compile time. And here you say, if I encounter an unresolved variable, and the name of this variable is robot, you can say, OK, the type for this variable is a robot. And now the script will pass static type checking and static compilation. Uh, no, not static compilation, sorry. Yeah, this is something important to, to say. <coughs> if you have yesterday without this talk, you can ask, OK, if I have compiled static, why would I use only type checked? 
this is a question we often listen to. See, okay, type check is cool, but let's go to compile static. Yes, go to compile static. But the problem with compile static is that it will not be able to statically compile dynamic code. So in that case, even if you say this variable is of type <coughs> robot, at compile time it will not know where robot comes from. How did you inject robot in your script? You have multiple ways of doing that. You can overwrite get property, you can inject it in binding. How can the compiler know that robot comes from get binding dot get robot? Cannot know. So you can help the type checker, but not the compiler in that case. But okay, it's enough. You can do that. It's enough to type check scripts just to ensure that it will not fail in production. You don't have to statically compile it. It's a bonus if you want to. You have ways to do that. If some people followed the talk with Andres yesterday about AST transforms, that's the way to go. With AST transforms, you have everything statically compiled. And you don't need extensions. Interesting thing to have is that with that extension mechanism, you can do better job than Java. For example, this is a string and this is some kind of template string. You're just saying here that the count here should be a number. Okay? But what if I don't put a number? What if I put a date here? With Java, you would compile that. It would pass compilation. With Groovy and static compile, comp compile static, the same. But now you have an option to type check that. And this is something that Paul King did for beta testing the type checking extension system. He wanted to say, okay, this is really interesting, but I want to be able to type check more than Java does. And he wrote that. So it's a script. The general schema is the same. You just have an event after method call. So we found an event. We check that the method is sprintf. You, t you take the arguments and then you have access to the AST tree. So you can split the constant string. You can find the pattern. And the important part is the last one. Actually, you find it. Here, you can add new errors at compile time. So using that script, you can plug into the type checking system and throw errors where the compiler would normally not throw errors. And this is interesting, for example, if you have constraints on some methods, you cannot currently say, for example, that one parameter must be between 0 and 10 and must only be a constant. I don't want to reference a variable. I want a constant. I don't want user to write complicated stuff. Set temperature 20. That's all. Okay? And you can type check that. And now, type checking, you can also throw new errors if the constant is outside of the bounds. So, DSL type checking, yes, but you're doing a bit more than just type checking because it's not just about types, it's about what you do, actually. So type checking extensions are also something interesting to have custom behavior at compile time. Uh, another idea was to type check SQL queries. So it's interesting too because you know that Scala, now in Scala 2.10, has macros 
And basically, macros are AST transforms. Okay, and the first experiment that I saw, I think it was by Guillaume Bort, was to type check a SQL query. Oh, we can do that in Groovy too. We can do the same. We can type check a SQL query. You have to write it. Maybe someone will contribute such a module, but you can do that. And it's not because we are in a dynamic world that we cannot do that. So now you have some more arguments to people from the static world saying, hey, we're better than you because we have static. We can do really interesting stuff in a dynamic language too. Static analysis is possible on a dynamic language. We had called NAC a few years ago. It's not because it's a dynamic language that you cannot do st stuff at compilation. And Timmy Yates actually did something which is not type checking that, but in the blog post he just sent yesterday, he added a, an extension that checks that this is actually syntactically correct. Which is not type checking, but at least checking the SQL query is correct. So we have a bit more than 20 minutes to show a <coughs> complex example because what I showed you is the easy part of the problem. And now we're going to have some fun. How many people use the Grace Bilm Bidler in the room? Oh, not so many. How many just know what a bin builder is? Right. Bin builder is something that looks like, looks like this. It allows you to write a Spring application context declaration with a builder-like syntax. So Spring, you know, you can have complex XML files where you define the beans. Okay, this is a bin of that type. Yes, very, very, very verbose syntax. The bin builder just shortens that using the builder syntax. You don't have XML anymore. But it has the same problem that XML file is that it's not type checked. So if you put a bin of the wrong time in the wrong property, you will fail at runtime, even Java. Okay, if you spring in Java and use a wrong type for a bin, it will fail at runtime. This example is just about type checking. So the syntax says that here I'm defining a bin which name is data source of type basic data source and setting the properties driver class name equals that, URL equals that, etc. And you have smart bits like this. You can use the ref syntax and ref just means data source is that one okay and you can even use data source without ref and what you see just by this example is that if I had taken that part of the code and put it before it works too so you have you can have forward references for example, if I use data source directly here and the data source is defined after, it still works. So typical type checking would definitely fail everywhere here. I'm going to show you the code. Are you ready? <laughs> so, so this is where you speak to me in Spanish. Okay, so this is just the first two classes here are just to have some kind of stub to the bin builder. I didn't want to use the real bin builder just for this example. So I'm using a bins method that takes a closure and that's all. I will use an extension, which is our script to type check. And now I'm using my bin builder, defining my bin of type foo, referring another foo which is defined afterwards. 
I can use the anonymous bin syntax, which means I have property of type child, which is a foo, but I'm defining it using closure. And the closure takes an argument type defining what is the type of the bin. Very interesting use case. And I think I have an error somewhere, which is, uh, let me check. Yes, line 29, wrong bin, yeah, was just in front of me. So what I'm showing you here is only one compilation error, which is the only error in the whole script. Now if I remove the extension, run the script, 14 errors. Okay, so how do you get from 14 errors to one error? Step by step. Yes. So step one. Okay, so I'm using IntelliJ2, okay. <laughs> but I didn't, have you noticed that my background is an eclipse? So the first version of my script is just basics of type checking, extension type checking, and I'm using here, oops, sorry. I just want to run my script, the first version, and I only have four errors left. But in fact, we will see that we can introduce new errors in the process. Ah, I should just remove that. Right. So the first thing to do is to find that you are in the context of the bin build. For example, if you have multiple builders in a method, you don't want to mix errors from one bin builder to another, from another, okay? So you have to define two, th two, two, two things that are really important is the context of your script. The context is where my extension starts and where it ends. So it starts when I find the bins method being called so I have a is bin builder helper method. And when the method is a bin builder, I'm defining what I call a new scope, which is just something like adding something to the stack, saying, okay, I will be able to store some data in a scope. And this is my workspace. I'm going to use that workspace to do smart stuff. And when I'm getting out of the beans method, okay? I'm popping my context and I will do some smart stuff like checking, for example, the reference beans. This is to solve the problem of reference bin being able to be defined before or after the usage. So you collect information and then in the end, you just use it. So one idea is that if you find an unresolved variable, that's something that the compiler says it's unresolved. So let's say in that example, it's, um, where is it? Okay, other food too. It's an unresolved variable because it isn't defined in this script, okay? So when we find that, we just say, let's check if it exists later. And when we exit the scope of my bin methods, I just verify that for all bins I have collected, this one exists. And if it doesn't, I'm throwing an error. So it looks complex because you have some setup just to define the scope. But remember that the bin builder example is a complex example because you have all the troubles you can find in DSL type checking. 
forward references. The fact that you can have multiple bean builders in the same script, in the same method, in the same class. You don't want to mix things from one to another. So using a script which is only 15, about 50 lines, 50 lines, you start from 14 errors to only four. Just don't try to understand all the code right now. It's just not interesting to get into the details. I'm just showing you that you should go step by step and you eliminate errors one by one and you find strategies to eliminate errors. So if I run that code, I just see that, okay, now it doesn't know about the ref method. How can I solve that? Step two. Using the ref method. So it doesn't find a method which is named ref. Okay. So I'm going to use the arguments. And here I'm using some kind of trick. I'm saying to the type checker, this method, even if it's not real, exists. And I want it to return the type of the bin which is referenced. So I'm using a keyword, which is new method. I can give it a name, and the closure here is to define the type of the method, the return type of the method. So I'm returning to the type checker a fake method which returns the type of the reference bin. Okay? And here, the get type method is important because this is typically what you want to use in a DSL type checker when you want the type checker to tell you what it thinks the type is. So it's the inferred type. So I'm saying that if I know that I'm using the ref method and I'm in an assignment, <coughs> foo equals ref bar, okay? Then I expect the type of the reference bin to be the left-hand side type. If it's not the same type, it's not a problem. We can handle that later. But what you expect from the ref method is to return the same type of the left-hand side of the bin. If I run that, oh, only two compilation errors. And we go to step three, just going a little trick here, just copy, okay. Next step, in the next step, <coughs> I've just said that you don't care if you return the wrong type, but we need to add a check because it's just, you said, okay, it should be the left-hand set type, but once I collected the bin, the actual bin type, which has been used by the user, it may be another type. So I have to check that the type corresponds to the left-hand side type. So I'm going to just to compare, just to show you the difference between the two scripts. Now, I'm just saying, okay, once I've done that, later, when I will exit the scope, I will check that the bin exits. And if it doesn't exist, I can add an error message to the user, a custom error message that says, I wanted a bin of type foo and you gave me a bar. Again, don't try to 
understand how I do that. It's the idea which is important. You can do that. Yeah, it took me just about a couple of hours. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so, if I run that, it's giving me one more error. Expected a bin of type foo, but found a string on line 29. Yes, that's true. And that's our real error. The only one in the script. <coughs> Next step is to tell you about an important variable, which is handle equals true. I just added that line. If you don't do that, the type checker will not be able to know that you handled the error. That you say, okay, it's correct. Because you can have complex logic in there, and the type checker cannot know that in your logic the error is handled. So if you say, okay, you thought it was an error, but it is not an error, I handle it. You just say handle equals true. Doesn't change in that case, yeah. It's important to use. Because if you don't do so, you would still have the error from the type checker, you know? You would have handled the error. You can enhance the types, but you would still have the error from the compiler. Next step. Don't worry. There are only two steps left. <laughs> so the next step is that, yes, where is my code? Yep, it's here. I did something from for the ref reference bin, but I can do the same for direct methods, okay? So, in that case, I want to check for the left-hand side, too, the types. And in that case, it removes one error, because I can say it's correct. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> That's the problem with doing conferences when you have a call. The next step is not really a difference in what we will do, but how we will do that. I'm taking my code, just show you the difference. What's the difference? In fact, I've just seen, just showed you that you can type check foo and ref, but we did that in two different sections of our script, and in fact, it's pretty, the, pretty much the same. So I'm just introducing a method, a new method in my script, which will just do the same for the two parts of the code. So I'm refactoring my code to introduce a new method which is, what is it? Okay, lost it. That's the problem. Where is it? Hey, an eclipse. Here it is, okay. So introduce the method check reference bin that I'm using instead of my block of code here. So
so it's just clearer now and you've seen that I didn't try to do that at first it's just pointless you add code you solve your errors and then you see okay it was almost the same in both situations I can simplify that so you develop your extension on the way step by step so if I run that one last time I see that there's only one error left which is the anonymous bin case and this one is tricky because on the left hand side you have a property of type foo but what is the type of this thing? It's a closure. Ooh. This works at runtime. I don't know who did that in Grazer, but it works. Okay. So probably someone overrides set property and checks that the property is a closure and then does some smart stuff, very smart stuff. And it works. But well, this is not valid code. You cannot assign a closure to a foo. Yes, you can. You can say that it's valid. I'm just doing it. And this will be the last step. I have a special event which is incompatible assignment. And in that event, I can say, okay, the right hand side was a closure. I'm in a binary expression, which means something. I should check actually that it's a nice assignment. Yeah. And if I do so, it's a closure expression too, because be careful, it's not because the type of the right hand side is a closure that you can do the check. You also have to check that it is a closure, not specifically a closure type a closure expression so you cannot reference a closure in that case and if we have it then you can go find the first parameter of the closure and tell the compiler that if it's compatible then it's okay and if it's not the right type you can change the error message that the compiler throws just to say instead of telling me this one which is cannot assign a value of mm, integer 2 type foo I want an error 2 for example if he uses bar I will send an error but not that one which is not user friendly I want a custom message which says you cannot assign a bar to a foo so this is what this code is about. And handle equals true is just to say I replaced your error message with mine. And we're done. So you survived. <laughs> Thank you. Any question? In Spanish, please? Yes? The you have to have the extension script on class path. That's all. And compile class path. But uh, then you, you cannot share with other. Sorry, I didn't understand. How do you share these extensions with, with other? Oh, you can share them just packaging them into a jar file. It's just a resource that you ha need to have on ClassPass, so it's not, not very difficult. Another question? No? Thank you then.